and I'm a board member of the Maryland Women's Heritage Center. Happy to be with you today. And we're here at the National Women's History Alliance awardees of 19, 2019 Women of Achievement. We have a great show for you today. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. for the National Women's History Project that has a new name of the History Alliance. So Pat, welcome and thanks for joining us today. I'm glad to be here. So tell us a little bit about the event uh, that we're having now or getting ready to have okay. and your role in that. Okay. Um, this event is something we hold annually here in Washington to honor outstanding women. And we pick a theme every year and this year's theme is peace and nonviolence. And so the timely topics. Yes. <laughs> something very important. Uh, all the to all the topics are important, right. but this one especially this time. And so we've honored uh, women who are deceased and women who are still alive, and most of them are here. Oh, wonderful. and we will be able to introduce them, tell a little bit about them, and um, and present them with a beautiful event. But the National Women's History Alliance is um, really all about making sure that people are aware of women's history because. Um, you know, the Smithsonian report about what is taught in the schools about women's history was really distressing. Yes. And so um, I loved um, what um, several people have said, but I think Sally Wright might have been the first to say, you can be what you can see, and if women and girls can't see role models that are women, then it's hard for them to be in that position, like an astronaut or an engineer. And so, um, it's really important that women's history is something that we include in everything that we talk about when we talk about this country and how we were settled, because women had such an important life. And as you know, we're getting ready to celebrate the 100th anniversary yes, yes. of women's suffrage, and that in itself is a tremendous um, thing that we will recognize it's next year. Topic, yes. That'll be our subject next year, and we'll recognize women who have been outstanding in helping support the vote and the fact that it took women 72 years to get the right to vote. And uh, we want to make sure that people understand that women make up half this earth and therefore we should be in many more positions of authority and the recognition that we have been in the past. I know we did work in Maryland. Similar. Oh yes. Similar. The justice battle. Well, this is... Um, um, more we do, we have a Hall of Fame, and then we're also doing working with our suffrage commission in Maryland. And I, we also work with the National Votes for the Trail, which is an effort across the country as well, so that each state, like ours, is trying to, to get that word out as well. So, uh, many years ago, uh, when I was a teacher, I worked with Molly when she was just starting out in the National Women's History Forty Department. years ago, we're yes. going to be next year. So can you tell us a little bit about that history as well? Well, the National Women's History Project, of course, started uh, 40 years ago. We'll be celebrating our anniversary. And um, when I worked at, I'm from Tennessee, I worked at Vanderbilt University for 30 years, and when I did Women's History Month, all of my material came from the National Women's History Project. And that's how I met Molly probably 30 years ago. And um, the Women's History Project has a wealth of information, but they publish documents like the Gazette that gives wonderful history and provides information to teachers or to community groups and organizations, women's organizations or groups, that tells them about how important it is to celebrate Women's History Month. It should be celebrated every month, right. but at least it's recognized in March. Especially in right. March. But Every and, month, and right? that is so true. So it's so important. And being from Tennessee and being the perfect 36th state that ratified the right. 19th Amendment, we are doing, as you mentioned, your uh, suffrage trail. We have a Tennessee trail mm -hmm. uh, where we're going to probably have at least six monuments that are brand new. Library markers? That will be monuments. Monuments. Monuments, monuments wow. of women who have done things to make sure that women's suffrage was successful. And in Nashville, we have the Tennessee Monument, which has five women, including Chair Harry Chapman Catt, okay. who came down from New York, 
to make sure that Tennessee did what we were supposed to do. And with the help of uh, Feb Byrne, her son Harry, who was the youngest legislator in Tennessee legislation at the time, changed his vote. Was this one about yes. from his mother? Oh, he got the note from his mother. And, well, I have met some of his relatives, and his nephew is actually writing a book right now, trying to set the record straight about his uncle. Because there are some things that people write about him that are not quite exactly true. Okay. But truthfully, Harry had in his mind all the time to vote for suffrage. Uh -huh. But he was being very diplomatic about it, and he told the suffragists who were there that he would not do anything to hurt them. That is true. But he wore the red rose when he went in to sit down in his seat in the legislature. So all the, the women suffragists who had the yellow roses thought he was going to vote against. He did vote for tabling the amendment twice, but it came up for final vote. And when it came to final vote, everyone assumed that Harry would vote no. But he said A, and so the vote was over one vote became uh, passed. But what was really interesting is the uh, Speaker of the House at that time was totally against it, but he changed his vote, which made two votes, which actually gave it a majority. And so it was not recalled, and so it passed. And there's a lot of story about Harry having to escape the Capitol because there was an angry mob. I bet. <laughs> that was not exactly true. The governor sent the sergeant of arms to him and said, I think we need to protect you. Harry didn't think he needed protection. They kind of hung around him and wanted to take care of him, and Harry did sneak through a door, out the window of the Capitol, on the ledge, and came down in the library on his own because he just wanted to go on his own. He didn't feel like he needed protection. And so uh, he got out of there and, uh, and was safe. But there was some stories about it, and this is true, that the governor did send some security to his hometown in Nyota, Tennessee, to protect him there because people were trying to get his mother to talk to him to change his vote. Oh, okay. And so, uh, no, he, was, he said that it was his honor to bring suffrage to 27 million women in this nation, and he felt like that was really an important thing for a young man to do, and it was very important for a young man to do. So Knoxville has a monument of Harry and his mom. And he's sitting in a chair and she's sitting with her hand on his shoulder. And so it's signifying how important he was and how important she was to Tennessee's and history. And that whole process. History Alliance 2019 honorees who are no longer with us. And this year we honor visionary women champions of peace and nonviolence. We often neglect the, to discuss that bravery is required to walk the path as a champion of nonviolence. Being an advocate for peace and nonviolence is not passively stepping away from conflict. On the contrary, it requires one to engage in countless courageous actions time and again despite the danger to oneself. Our deceased honorees recognize nonviolence as the means of establishing peace by resolving conflicts and inequalities without violence, using new tools and techniques. All of our 2019 honorees choose to, chose to devote their lives to lessening violence, promoting peace education, and involving themselves personally in the struggle for a more peaceful future. Um, Mary Burnett Talbert was the only African-American woman in her graduating class from Oberlin College in 1888 and became a leader in the women's club movement and also spoke out for women's suffrage and other reforms. 
As one of the founders of the NAACP, Mary exposed the national audience to the horrors of lynching and violence against African American people. In 1922, just a year before she died at age 57, she led a national campaign with the slogan, A Million Women United to Stop Lynching. Mary's work and activism set the stage for the civil rights movement later in the century, century and we can look to her as inspiration in today's struggles for civil rights. Sarah Brady was another woman who responded personally to our violent society and found a way to make a difference. She became a leader in the call for gun control after her husband was shot during an attempt to assassinate President Ronald Reagan in 1981. Disturbed by the easy availability of guns, she testified against weakening the Gun Control Act of 1968. Sarah was instrumental in the passage of the Brady Handgun Violence Prevention Act in 1993 which has prevented an estimated 2 million gun sales to people with felony records. Sarah, who died in 2015, raised her powerful voice against violence, understanding the that the reduction of guns is essential to achieving a peaceful, less violent future. Dorothy Cotton was a 29-year-old church secretary in Pittsburgh, Virginia, when she met Martin Luther King Jr. in 1960. From that time on, she devoted herself to civil rights and political empowerment of African Americans in the South and throughout the country. She soon became the only woman in Dr. King's inner circle and one of the most influential women in the civil rights movement. As director of the legendary Citizen Education Program, she helped build the movement by training thousands of African American residents in history, organizing, and voter registration. She stressed nonviolence and civil disobedience in the face of racist violence, and she suffered hearing loss after an attack while desegregating a whites-only beach in Florida. Dorothy Cotton lived 88 years and worked every day for citizen empowerment, nonviolent solutions, and civil rights for all. Educator Elise Boulding was a writer and sociologist who was nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize in 1990. A scholar and author who grew up during World War II, she realized that violence was not the answer to the world's problems. Despite the Cold War, she reached out to women in Russia and other countries and founded the Peace Research, Research Association to develop new studies in peace research. Through her work at the Peace and Conflict Studies, Elise advanced the theory that peace is an everyday practice rather than a dull, static state, and that peace comes from strong families, women's leadership, educating children about nonviolent problem solving. She believed that all young people could understand nonviolence and become co creators of a peaceful future. Peace Pilgrim encouraged peace and nonviolence through a life of personal witness. Born Mildred Norman in 1908, she had a spiritual vision during the Korean War that inspired her to spend the rest of her life speaking with people while walking across the country for peace. In 1956, she gave away all of her possessions except the clothes on her back, a comb, and toothbrush and set off walking, wearing a blue tunic with the words Peace Pilgrim on the front and 25,000 miles on foot for peace on the back. As she walked, she depended on the kindness of strangers for food and shelter, and she frequently spoke as a pacifist and vegetarian to church, university, radio, and tele television audiences. She was, sorry, she was 72 when she died during her seventh cross-country walk for peace in 1981. Welcome back, and I'm here now with Martha Wheelock from California, and you can see by her very special outfit here, she's been involved in women's history and the suffrage activities for many years. So tell us a little bit about your story and your involvement with women's history. 
I, well, I've been a filmmaker for a long time, documentary filmmaker. I fell in love with, with suffrage history mm -hmm. at the 75th anniversary of Women's Right to Vote, mm -hmm. and made a film then called Votes for Women. Mm -hmm. But that start, that was because I marched in 1970 down Fifth Avenue to the 50th. So I feel like I've been involved with it since I, for, for the past 50 years, basically. And um, when I discovered these women, I, I found the poets. I found something that gave me not only courage but a passion, mm -hmm. and um, you can't you can't stop once you've been right. written, you know, it's in right. your blood. Right. So I've gone on to be a, a recorder of, of artists and uh, writers, women writers, uh, Bernice Abbott, Mae Sarton, uh, Madeline Langville, all of them myself. Some of those I've heard of, but some of them I have not. Yeah, well we try to keep yeah. them alive. Yeah. And then I made, I made three... Three, four, three films on women's suffrage, mm -hmm. Votes for Women for, seven, 19, for the 75th anniversary, uh -huh. and I celebrated the centennial of, of California women winning the vote in 2011. And the women of California, boy, were they awesome. They, they invented a lot of things that the rest of the country right. used. Right, adapted to And Absolutely. so we have, uh, we have the, mar the way they marketed themselves. This, this, these sashes are branding. They wore these hats. And that originated in California? The, that, 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 that was later from the National Women's Party. Oh, yeah. But right. the women in California did a lot of things like they they, they developed the flower seeds, oh. and it's, which became the yellow roses back here. Mm -hmm. But in California, they were the sunflower seeds. And, oh. and they market this button is, oh, I have one of these buttons here, mm -hmm. is from California. And of course, they, 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 they it's a big state to organize. Right. And they figured out commercial marketing and uh, it, it's a great story. And then I just finished the film last 2016 on the centennial of the death of Inez Milha. And she uh, gave her life for women's right to vote and traveled in 1916 all around the West Coast to get uh, women to vote against the political party in power. Mm -hmm. um, and which was at that time Woodrow Wilson. Mm -hmm. Did not support our right, right. right to vote. Right. And she dies very suddenly on the podium in Los Angeles mm -hmm. with her last speech, her last words were, Mr. President, how long must women wait for liberty? And now I'm working on the, the story of the Justice Bell in Pennsylvania in 1915. Oh. And it's a story of how these women made a replica of the Liberty Bell and traveled it around the country. Around there was in a wagon or something. It was on a truck, a yes. Truck? You, yeah. Well, you know your history. Good girl. I'm, I'm, yeah. Yeah. Bits. And, uh, it's a so. That's that's. I think it's a it's a story of grassroots. Mm -hmm. We forget. I mean, we all know the big the big sure. leaders. Sure. But the way that the women of little towns and and had found their voice and found their technique. It's just a, it's a wonderful story. And the the marketing specialty is so good because I have about Inez and her horse. Yeah. And that's how we can get students to remember her. Right. Well, then that's. She should be remembered for a lot more than that, oh, yeah, but because but that's what kids will remember. Because I know we've used your video in oh, some good. of our pro educational programs, and again, those people were clueless about yeah. so many women that were involved. They may have heard about Susan yeah. and some of the others, but, but they don't know that somebody died for our right to vote. I mean, we think we, we know our Martin Luther Kings and our Gandhis, Gandhis, and all that. But this is, I mean, we just don't. We just don't know and we don't toot our history enough, right? You know? Right. So, so we have a lot more work to I'm do. I'm here to spread the history. That's thank right. you for yes. thank, thank you, you for, for talking, talking to me. Today. And, and I'm off to I'm off, off to, to introduce this wonderful woman named Peace Pilgrim. Peace Pilgrim for twenty eight years walked across this country with a comb, toothpaste. She never when she was only eight but she was given food and she went for the first part, she went 25,000 miles. Mm -hmm. Speaking about this, I'm unbelievable. Unbelievable story. So, well, thank you again for sharing that story. Thank you. Welcome back. And I'm here this afternoon with Kate Campbell Stevenson, who is a member of our board, but yes, also indeed. the vice chair of AUW in the state of Maryland, and many other titles and activities related to women and women's history. So, Kate, thank you for being here today. It's my pleasure. And I know that you're always working on new material and new stories. What are you working on now? What are you going to be doing in the near future? Well, since it's going to be the 100th anniversary of women, women winning the vote, it was uh, passed in Congress in 1919 mm -hmm. and it was ratified in 1920, I'm really working on my programming, Amending America, How Women Won the Vote. 
and I have a timely. Yes, timely. indeed. And I have an hour-long program where I bring to life historical American women, mm -hmm. women who were very influential in that whole movement. And then I also have a two-hour interactive uh, workshop that I oh. take all around the country. And so I am thrilled to be able to bring that to many audiences. I work in partnership right now with the National Archives. And so I will be uh, doing my Many America show for them on May 10th at the opening of their new exhibit. It's this, year, this year. This year. Oh, this year. Great. They have a new exhibit opening up on May 10th called Rightfully Hers. And I will be part of that opening ceremony for the exhibit. And so and the performance is free. It's at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. So please, anybody, come on down. It's going to be at the McGowan Theater on um, May 10th. Mm -hmm. Is that during the weekend or is that during the Well, it's a Friday weekend? afternoon. Mm -hmm. Friday afternoon. Mm -hmm. So tell me some of the stories of, are you telling people's, people's stories or places? Or? Oh, yeah. Um, it's women's stories. Uh, I really, I talk about, start off with Abigail Adams and Remember the Women uh, speech. But, and I, I talk briefly about the women in the 1800s. Mm -hmm. Many people know those stories. What I like to concentrate on is the um, women, the younger women, in the early 1900s who really joined forces, forces with the old guard and they brought the energy of youth and their enthusiasm to really push right, that, from that decade of 2010 to, to, to I'm sorry, from 1910 to 20, to 1920, mm -hmm. to really make that to bring those facts. Yeah. 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 Alice Paul, mm -hmm. Lucy Burns, and and also one of the people I highlight are people from uh, the all-female town council of Jackson Hole, Wyoming. Oh, yeah. When uh, uh, women were winning the vote nationally, Wyoming women had had the vote since 1869. Mm -hmm. So in 1920, they were running for office. Mm -hmm. And they were a good example of uh, taking action because they were tired of not getting things done, but th what they needed, the infrastructure in the town. And they said, we can do it. I find it amazing, too, that so many of the early adopters of women's right to vote are in western states. Yes, they are. Um, Washington, Oregon, I think mm -hmm. Idaho, and mm -hmm. plus Wyoming. No. So that's they, amazing. They, well, they first won the right to vote mm -hmm. right there. And I think they were wonderful uh, role models mm -hmm. for how to get things done. I know another area where there's a lot of missing history is the role that African American women played. Yes. I know that in Maryland we're finding a number of African American women like Augusta Chisel um, and her sister um, and a couple of the Delta Sigma Thetas. Mm -hmm. Are those stories going to be incorporated? In I will be adding them in mm -hmm. for. Mm -hmm. uh, 2020, mm -hmm. and I'd love to tell their stories. It's so powerful, and African American women, right, have, have been left out, and and we need to make those stories more available. One thing I'm worrying about too is the role of uh, women getting the right to vote, and also how that was sort of parallel with the abolitionist movement, mm -hmm. and how um, Frederick Douglass was probably one of the biggest champions of all women wanting to vote. So it's interesting to hear that we have such a hero that was helping us as right. well. When right. he took a lot of negative, negative is negative, well, because he, he was helping us right. and, and for women and men. So was he was a young man mm -hmm. in, in the 1848 uh, first suffrage, mm -hmm. women's suffrage conference mm -hmm. in uh, Seneca Falls, New York. Mm -hmm. And he was really pushed it. Mm -hmm. He really pushed it and, and made it happen. It was wonderful to have his support. And, throughout history, uh, the long 72 years of women pushing to win the vote, he was right there, right there. So, th indeed, and we, that's a Maryland man. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So we've got a lot to be proud of, and also, I know that as this year evolves, many states, like Maryland and others, are finding um, the women that were doing things. I know in many states like ours, they're ha having markers mm -hmm. put up just so that we can get more of the story out. Not just for 2020, but it'll be ongoing. We need so to have women's stories visible. Right. When we have those plaques, they read about it. Mm -hmm. Oh, I wonder who that is. Mm -hmm. If we can find out more information. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, in your in your work as well, um, talk a little bit about how uh, some of those suffrages may have changed um, engagement, social justice reform, or community development. Or, or those kinds of things. Well, I'm thinking about Alice Paul. Mm -hmm. Alice Paul was uh, 
she was a Quaker. She went over to England. She learned a lot of the strategies from the British suffragettes. Mm -hmm. But because she was a Quaker, it was nonviolent. She was nonviolent. Brought that back here. But then, after women won the vote, she knew that um, that was just the beginning of really making it a true uh, participation participation of women active in, in voting, that we had to have uh, uh, more laws written. And she was the author of yeah, policies, and she was the author of the Equal Rights Amendment, and so she fought very hard for that. And she also uh, was very active in the international peace movement. So the women who were involved in the suffrage movement, they were abolitionists, uh, they were civil rights, as well to education, yes, education, right, right, uh, to really improve the world, mm -hmm. and they did, yeah, and bring about a more equal uh, participation. It's ironic to me that we're still, still challenged by many of those issues, not just in the women's community, but across the board in terms of civil rights even in our country. Absolutely, get out to the well, side that's of why it's so important to get these stories out there mm -hmm. and to. Provide that inspiration to know that we cannot just sit by and be idle. We can learn from these stories, be inspired for them, and to realize we need to step up. Everybody needs to step up and take action to secure these rights and to make sure it's the equality is for everybody. So it's always important to have these women's stories visible so they can inspire our audiences to continue with these, promoting these rights, and that it's inclusive. And we we do that at the Maryland Women's Heritage Center. Right. What we've tried as we built our new website in the last year or so, we have a particular button that's for suffrage resources, and also we have posted on the website her story, which our, our video producer, Loretto Gubinatis, has over the last 10 years, done uh, video productions of interviews such as right. this one, mm -hmm. and also large-scale events related to something about women's history, not always about suffrage. It could be about STEM, other than it's been about um, uh, women in the military. So we have a lot of those stories that we've been trying to build for the last 10 years. So um, YouTube and the technology has been a great boon to get all those resources better out there. And in the next couple of years, um, there'll be even more. And I know that, for example, we're linked to the National Collaboration of Women's History Sites and the Votes for Women Trail, so that all the Maryland things are on there, but also that particular resource, I can find out what happened in New Jersey or California or Wyoming. And so um, many people are building those databases just to learn about it. And students of all ages can learn more of those first stories. And I invite our listeners to go to these wonderful resources at the Maryland Women's Heritage Center. Org. That's right. That's right. Hope to see you there. Great. Thanks again, Kate, for being with us today. It's my pleasure. Right.